What is good, YouTube? This is the FF Dynasty coming at you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, like, and comment below with either love or if you're feeling like some hate, throw some shade down there. Either way, it all greatly helps us out so we can keep bringing you new content. Mm, a fresh pop for our uh, freshest guest, Ray GQ. What is good? Man, I'm I'm feeling it, man. This is uh, I'm excited. Uh, it's draft week, baby. It's draft week, and you know we got the we got the the four dads on the mic, and the hot mic, and talking some wide receivers. So I'm excited, man. I'm doing well. I appreciate you guys having me on and uh, taking time out of your schedule to to have me on. I know you don't have a lot of guests often, and you chose for me to follow up. Waldman and Angelo, so I think that's kind of a dick move, but it's all good, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. No pressure, baby. No pressure. <laughs> hey, pressure, man. Pressure makes diamonds, man. I'm good. I am a <laughs> Jay Wayne loves it when the get, soundboard has got, got oh, battery power. Yes. That bone crusher, that bone crusher yes. got you. You ain't never scared. Come on, man. It's high school shit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, we're going to hit you off with the same question we've been starting everybody off with, just kind of getting a little feel from, you know, who you are, where you came from, and why you do this. You know, all that kind of stuff always seems to get pushed away, and nobody ever really knows, and I feel like it's, you know, kind of important. And, and we, we've we talked about it over time with our show, but when we get people on, I like to just, you know, have them tell us, you know, where you came from, who you are, and, and what drives you to, to do what you're doing. Yeah, man. Uh, just, you know, from Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, grew up there, went to high school there, uh, coming out of high school, got a, I had a couple of offers to some smaller division one schools, UNLV, Boise state before it became like a power that it is now. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I was kind of a knucklehead in high school and got into some trouble my senior year, but luckily one of the position coaches at Boise knew this coach at division two school in Nebraska that I'd never heard of Shadron state. So ended up playing football out there at Shadron state and one of my most recognizable teammates that you all probably know and everyone listening was Danny Woodhead. We were part of the same recruiting class. So Danny Woodhead. Uh, played with Woodhead. Hopefully um, you don't have the same barber as that man. Cause that dude was something. That <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, Danny is the, he's the most humble dude, man, to, like, and from the first practice that I remember, like, playing against him, I was like, this kid is special. And what position were you at? I was a defensive back. I was a cornerback. So, uh, playing, played against him quite a bit in practice. Um, but I love football, man. I love college. I love college football. And uh, got into Dynasty probably about six or seven years ago. My first fantasy team, I had no clue what I was doing. I drafted all Dallas Cowboys. Like, I had no fucking clue. Just <laughs> I thought I had the best roster, right? Troy Hambrick and all these other crappy Cowboys. But um, what really kind of got me into, like, being an analyst, and I say that in air quotes because I really don't consider myself that. I just like to entertain people and talk about football. That's really what I'm doing. Like, for sure. I'm not, and like, I don't have, and we'll get to the process stuff, but I don't have all these fancy processes and models and all of that stuff. I just talk football. I watch football. I, I feel like I'm a decent evaluator. I feel like I understand the game a little bit. And that's not to say that I know more than anybody else because I played, but I know some of the shit that is talked about it really doesn't matter. Like when you're in practice and you're on the field, that stuff really doesn't matter. So um, I just, a year ago, I was like, I can do this better than a hell of a lot of other people who are talking about it. That's why exactly we're right. <laughs> so in February of 2019, I started tweeting some stuff out and some people were like, Oh, come write for me. And it was with dynasty nerds and DLF. And then uh, now I'm just like kind of, rocking with DLF and doing my own thing with the Destination Debbie, man. So I just, I love football and I love fantasy and the Dynasty format is, is really fun because you get to be that GM, right? And build That's your right. team and all that other good stuff. So it's pretty much it, man. Yeah. Well, if you haven't, if you're not up on the YouTube channel, make sure you go check that out. It's Destination Debbie, right? Yes, sir. Got to go check that out. He's killing it. Um, and the, what's the Twitter handle? Ray GQ, R-A-Y-G-Q-U-E, Ray GQ. If you're not already following that man, go ahead and, and get you some because he's he's tweeting out some good stuff. Sometimes. Sometimes. I mean, we're not big Twitter guys, but you're, uh, <laughs> you're, you're doing your thing over there. Yeah, and, yes, and 
if you if you're trying to watch any type of film, like definitely hit up that Destination Devi website. I mean, or, or YouTube page. I know you got you got your own podcast on there, the All Gas Show, and then you do the Destination Devi podcast that goes up there. But then you also got a bunch of All Twenty Twos, which is kind of a new thing. That, like they're just starting to come out with this col with colleges. It was hard to find them in the past. And I gotta say, man, I gotta say thank you for highlighting the player that I'm trying to watch <laughs> because yeah. oh my god, there's some other All Twenty Twos out there, and like. I'm like trying to figure out who's got what socks on. Like I got to like pause yeah. it and then like, yeah. does he have turf tape on? Who's got, where is he? God forbid he's yeah. moving all over the formation, you know, which usually I like, but now I'm like pissed off about like, <laughs> so yeah, all 22s, a lot of people try to charge an astronomical amount. If you're not a part of that all 22 coaches film world, it's like, it's crazy what people charge for that. And I'm giving away for free. So I yeah. uh, appreciate you checking it out, man. And anybody else who wants to watch some coaches film, I think it's the best way to, to evaluate players. Broadcast film is fun for entertainment, but when I'm scouting, I don't even use it yeah. when I'm looking at players. It just doesn't, there's it doesn't some, tell the whole story. Right. There's some different slow-mo replay on the broadcast. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, there's a couple of angles here and there that, that, that really do you in, but especially on like receivers, man, like they call hike, they zoom in on the quarterback. You can't see, what happened for yep. majority of the place is some, it's really hard to evaluate receivers a lot of the time, but if you yep. can't get a hold of some of the all 22, so really appreciate that. Um, we'll keep it moving here. What, what, what's your process on evaluation? I know you just said you don't really have, which I, I feel you like, I really like that. We don't really necessarily have a model and a checklist and some wild system of anything. Not that we're knocking anything. Cause we just had Matt Waldman right. on here and he was basically super analytical with his film process, which was wild. And how he just broke down all these little things and was saying how he charted Ahmad Bradshaw on a game where he had 1.9 yards per carry, but it, he charted him as having a great game just from all these little things that he did. And, that you know, that's not me, and that doesn't sound like it's you. So how how, how are you rolling? Respect the hell out of Waldman, too, man. I'll say that and everybody else. Peter Howard, there's a lot of people out there that put in a lot of work with their process uh, me, I don't have that. I'm not going to do that unless I'm getting paid a nice penny to do that. I don't have the time. Like it's just not happening. Yeah, but I also I just my opinion and I'm not trying to like sound as elementary and one-on-one -on -one as possible, but football isn't that difficult, right? Like you can turn on the tape and you can see somebody play and be like, holy shit, this dude is play? legit. Right. Definitely. Or he's okay. And then yeah. they go to the combine and you get a little more information on said player. It's to me, it's not rocket science. Like, uh, so my process, I watch college football religiously on Saturdays. I mean, I've got big 10 network subscription. I'm just like, I'm standing up in front of it and the screen has got like eight games on and I'm just kind of looking at everything. And then I go back and I, I, I'm so much of a college football nut. I have record games on Saturday that I want to see from smaller schools because I play D2. So right. I like to pay attention to the smaller mm -hmm. divisions. Um, and I'll watch them on Monday. I'll watch them on Tuesday. Like I'm watching college football every day of the week just about. But, I mean, I gather my opinions, right? Okay, Chuba Hubbard looked good last year. He's going to be on my board for 2019. And then in the summertime, slowly but surely, I dive into a little bit of the tape. Chip but I'm not, I'm not charting. I think the if you have the time, the best way to do that is to chart it, right? Look at what wide receivers do versus zone and man coverage. Look at what running backs do. There's different situations. Running on first and 10 is a hell of a lot different than taking a draw on third and 20 when there's three right. down linemen, one linebacker, and seven DBs, right? But I just don't have the time for that. So more so than anything, my process is I want to entertain you. I want to inform you on players that I like or I'm highlighting. And then you take that information back, do your own research and formulate your opinion on those guys. That's really what I do. That's you're scratching us right where we itch. We tell people all the time. That's what we talk about on Patreon a lot. Like, listen, I'm not here. I'm giving you my opinion, but I want to be here to just help you along in your process. I want you to do a little bit of work, give you my opinion, tell you what I think. And then you do it with it. What you like, I don't want you to be like, well, I got this guy ranked over this guy. So you have to take that guy. Like yeah. you're stupid. If you don't like, I mean, we're, we're, we're all about that life. So I, I, I like where your head's at here, man. I appreciate that. And, and uh, why, and why do all that when you've got people out here who crunch the data and the numbers for you? Like, I don't, right. why, why am I reinventing the wheel? I, there's no point in Agreed. doing that. Like, I just want to entertain and inform. That's really what it boils down to for me. 
I agree 100 percent, man. And well, I'm, you and I'm to, right uh, a lot more than I'm wrong too. Just throw well, I mean that's got to be that's got to be part of it. And you know you can boil it down to whatever you want, but that's kind of how we stand and how we've been going for so long is that you know a professional gambler basically needs to hit 55 to 60 percent of the time. So you know you got to be over you got to be over fifty percent, and our track record stands as being a decent amount over fifty percent. You're not everyone is going to get shit wrong. Like right. I love plenty of guys that suck. I love Samaj P. Ryan. Where's he at? Like nowhere. Um, not that I thought he got a fair shake necessarily. <laughs> I don't hey, his his, uh, his cousin's going to bring us right back though, Michael. <sighs> oh boy. Yeah. Hey, uh, real quick though, Ray, I got another question on your process. Pros- yeah, your process. Uh, you've got the YouTube channel, you got your podcast, you got all 22 cutups that you're doing. You go on other people's shows. You got a full time job on top of all that. You're a father of two boys. When do you sleep, man? Dude, I don't. That's the crazy thing, man. I like I thought about the other day. Like I don't know when the last time I've been in bed before like 11 p.m. Like I'm just fucking up because I, I want to watch TV at the end of the day. I'm turning on Netflix. I want to watch the to Office and the Ozark, and you know I've got my vices that I do at late night that I just you know I don't do around the kids. So I want some me time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you I got mean, to. You just it's all for the people, man. It's all for the people. <laughs> and but I will say this. I always said that I'll do this as long as I'm having fun, right? When it feels like it's becoming a job and it's taken away from my boys, it's taken away from my wife, uh, then I'll stop. And that's why I'm up so late because I've got to spend time with them and give my wife some time. And then if I want to do this, then late night is when I have to work. So yeah, yeah, I I don't really sleep. Got to grind you know, up, all, yeah. up all night to get lucky. Like for real say, you know, you gotta, you gotta make your own luck, right? That's what, that's what he's Absolutely. talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Well, you ready to get on to uh, talking some actual football here? Let's do it, man. All right. Well, we're going to talk receivers with Ray. You alluded to it there in a, in the beginning. Um, we're going to start with just kind of your top six guys. We'll work backwards. We'll start at six. Um, I guess the first thing I would do before we even get going is you want to, you have a tier that you, do you break these guys up in tiers first before we get into a ranking and, and how would you do that? All right. Yeah. I, I normally rank them first, right? I'll rank okay. my top 10 or top 15 or top 20. And then from there, I kind of break it down into tiers and I, I, I try to do that two periods of time. I do that during the college football season, and then I do it after kind of the combine once more information has come out. Um, so I really think tier-based ranking is the way to go. Tier them and then rank with inside the tier, right? So once okay. you've got your tier one, I'll kind of move people around. Yeah. It's a fluid process. All right, well, let's roll through these six guys that we got, and then we'll tear them up when we're done, and we'll uh, eat that we're stupid. <laughs> All right, so your sixth guy is who? Number six for your 2020 rookie wide receivers. Who is Ray GQ? Who's right there? Uh, it's Mims Ins, Higgin Mims, <laughs> Mims Higgins. It's Denzel Mims right now, but once we stop the show, it's probably T Higgins, and then when I wake up tomorrow, it's probably Denzel Mims. But right now, at right. this moment, well, again, Denzel why Mims rankings are, are so tough and it's so subjective. Because it's like, I could be feeling one way one day and the next another. So, I, I feel you on that. I got Mims there now, though. Mims is my sixth, sixth ranked wide receiver in the class today. I like so Mims. The, the question is, is after the combine, people immediately shot Mims up ahead of a bunch of dudes. And now it seems like, you know, maybe you dropped him back a little or you're not. he's not quite up there with you. Is there any thoughts on that? or? Uh, I think pre-combine he was eight for me. So then he really didn't move up that far, right? He moved up three spots and it's, it's, I wouldn't just say it's because of the combine because one of the guys that I had higher, you know, Henry Ruggs, he fell a little bit for me after the combine, which I know that seems like ass backwards, but um, Mims was, Mims was always in my top 10 and being down here in the state of Texas, I've seen a lot of Baylor games. I've been to quite a few Baylor games. So I've heard about Denzel Mims, got to see him, whether I wanted to or not. Uh, but I think he is a very good talent. He's a talented wide receiver and I always point to that sec- second year, right? Sophomore year production. He had over a thousand yards as a sophomore, which is huge for me, right? Big time. Even though he fell off a little bit as a junior, then he came back to dominate as a senior. So 
Uh, I think he just has – he's a solid, Some of that junior year could have been a, an injury. He had a broken hand, I think, for a decent amount of that, that hand, campaign. And that Baylor team was horrible. It was awful, um, yeah. Yes, it was bad. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to – let's – I don't want to make excuses for him, right? Yeah, but he right. did have a down junior year. But he came back and he showed that same dominance that he did as a, as a sophomore. Only thing is he's kind of an older prospect, which I am kind of an ageist in Dynasty – even though at the wide receiver position, I don't feel like it matters as much as running backs, mm-hmm. uh, but he is a little bit older, but he's, he went to the combine and just blew it up. And then even before that, right, he went to the senior bowl and right. by all accounts, he was the best wide receiver out there, which is another, he just yeah. checked every freaking box after that's the, the. I think that's the biggest thing with him right now is that he's checking. He really is checking all them boxes. Yep. Yep. So what, what I, I look at him as like, he's, he might be the best cheater in the class. Like he uses his hands and cheats at the top of that route better than all the dudes that I've watched. I think he's like that kid that's like spends more time trying to figure out how to cheat. And if he just spent that much time studying, he would have passed, but he's just like so good at cheating. No, nah, but I think that's a huge, like, I think being good at cheating is a huge part of being good at playing receiver, especially if you're a bigger, more physical player like he is not to say that obviously you blew the combine up. So there's some good physical uh, athleticism there, but, well, well I say, how, how do you cheating, feel about that? Cheating, I think that's a good thing. Like, I didn't mean – Right, yeah, no, me too. It sound like a bad thing. What's your thoughts I'm, on that? I mean, especially very, coming from the DB perspective. I'm right. very proud of you. I'm very proud of you because that is an astute observation that many people have not talked about. But I believe if you check out the – it's either the UTSA game or the Texas game, I think it's the first or second play of the game – his hand fighting at the top of his routes, I, I pointed that out. It's just impeccable how he's so able good. to just get that subtle push off yeah. to create that little bit of separation, and the best receivers in the NFL do it. The Andre you have Hopkins to. does it all the time. I you mean, you have to, but you got to do it in a way to get away with it, right? You right. can't. You got to be good at cheating, right? Yes, it's it's yes. not it's not getting caught with extending those arms. It's su- it's keeping them inside the frame right there and getting away with it. And it's they caught it. The they called it T-Rex. They called it T-Rex. When we were in college, they would teach the wide receivers. They said, act like your arms are like T-Rex arms and everything that you do, do it in tight. Don't extend, just right. keep it tight and then do it. As, as a DB though, you're trying to get your hands on him and you're trying to battle him throughout that whole route. And so he's got to be able to wha- wax you off, get on top of you. Like I was watching a Brett Coleman video. He said he, he treats route running like a box like a moving boxing match and it's, he's just so physical he's pro- he's got to be the, the most physical wide receiver in this class to me do you agree with that he's pretty physical man especially within his routes he's very right. he's very good he's you know i, I haven't really thought about it like that after the catch yeah yeah not, not after, after the, catch, the catch but going up to make the catch like he he's i've never seen so many defense pass interferences that went for catches like this dude is just he won't be out bullied. Like he's just going up and make ridiculous yeah. catches. He definitely plays a good brand of bully ball at the top of his routes. Uh, that, and that's part yep. of what I like Mims. And then, like you said, he checked all those boxes. He has some athleticism. I would thought I would see a little, once those combine numbers came in, I thought with those numbers, you thought you would see like a little bit more separation um, across the board and in his routes, especially playing in the big 12, but it didn't seem like it was always there. And I it surprised me a little bit that the numbers were that great at the combine, not to take anything away from Mims. He's, he's fantastic. Surprised me too. Surprised yeah. me too. I didn't see, I didn't see four, three, eight on tape. You know what right. I mean? I didn't see four, three, eight. I, yeah. The build up speed looks that. good. Yeah. Yeah. He's a former track star. So them boys know how to run a 40 yard dash, you know, like that's the it's ticket. That's the that's why I say to me the forty is one of the most it's probably the most overrated fucking thing in football. Like for certain like I get it, right? You wanna see if a player's got that long speed and able to to but there's nothing like having the heat on your behind chasing you, right? Game speed versus time speed is completely different to right. me, in in my opinion, right? Well, and I mean the analytical people will battle you to death on that, that, that makes no sense, but I mean I don't, I feel like that's just comes from, and I'm not going to say that, you know, you have to have played to, to know anything, but I mean, so let me, let me, let me, let me ask you this. All th- everybody on this pod, everybody on this show, you can go in your street right now and run full speed, right? And you'll have your, your, your time. Put a pit bull behind you. I bet you run just a tad bit faster if that damn dog was chasing you and you had to get right. to the crib. 
Yeah. yeah. Or you I've might fuck these- up and stumble, you know? There you go. I, I've told these dudes all the time that like when, when we're explaining that kind of stuff is like, man, like when you put me on a field and I go run by myself, it's whatever. But if I have to chase somebody down, I could usually catch somebody back in the day. Like I'm just, but like if we ran at two separate times, that dude's probably going to smoke me. But like right. for whatever reason, I could usually catch somebody. So yep. it's just, it's different. So, so Ray, I know you got, I know you got Mims at six and, and you teeter in between five and six, but what are some of the things that are keeping him out of, of g- climbing up into that top five or being like towards the top of that five? I mean, if you have him there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue. It's yeah. just a little bit of personal preference, right? It's just a little bit of, once you, I'll just say this, all six of these guys outside of maybe number one, you could switch them and I wouldn't, I wouldn't bat an eye. Like if you yeah. could take my number two and put them at six, you could take my five, put them at three. It's all razor ass thin for that's, me. Um, that's kind of why I went, we had initially had five. I kind of went to six cause that's kind of how I feel. Like, I feel like yeah. I'm all right. I'm, I agree with you. I think you could take the top guy and kind of split them off a little bit, but it's not as big as I think some people make it out to be. And I think, uh, but these rest of these guys, I'm not mad at you. However you want to chop them up. So with yep. that being said, um, I, I currently have Mims at number six as well. I know Jay Wayne has him a little higher. Um, yeah, but- I think I got to slide him in at three right now, but I mean, that could change. But I just, just the, the exquisite ball skills and the physicality and getting off the line of scrimmage, like he's, he, he reminds me a bit of DK beating press coverage. Um, well, he's an explosive physical vertical threat that just can't be out blocks and so I think there's a lot of potential but like you said man I I can't argue with you however you want to chop these guys up I think that just speaks to the the overall strength of this class and how all these boys know how to use their head and shoulders to to make fakes and they they stick hard you know play hard stick hard and the only time you love them well you know you know the rest but like these boys all know how to I think the thing that separates some of them though is that physicality so that's kind of what's giving me the edge with Mims right now but um I mean I, like I said great class I'm ready is to you, is your six on this list is your six on this list out of these yeah so who would you who who are you switching Mims with uh well, I think I got to, like you said, if you, if I want to put your number two at the number six, that's what I would, that's what I'm at right now. Okay. But I, I honestly, okay. we'll get to your number two in a little bit. I don't know what to do with that guy. We'll, we'll, I'll give it away. It's, it's Rager. I, I'm confused. I don't know if, how to- if anybody fucks with him, they know, they know your love affair for, for <laughs> right. Rager. Right. So I don't know. I don't know what to make of it, man. I get ex- We'll get, we'll, we'll get the Rager in a little bit. I'll leave it there. All right. All right. So let's move to number five. I'm with you at six uh, with Mims. Jay Wayne has Mims at three. Um, five for you is T Higgins. And I'm, uh, I think I'm a, I'm a scotch higher on him than you, but I'll let you have the floor on Higgins. What's up with Higgins? I mean, it really, I mean, I had him four. he was four. And then like, after everything, the dust settled, I, I moved Jefferson up, but I mean, T is a dog. T is a beast. And what I like most about him is coming into 2019, everybody wrote him off as like the number two. It was like Justin Ross, Justin Ross, Justin Ross. He's the alpha. And then T went out there and just completely dominated in 2019. And if you look at the national championship game, when he left the field, Clemson could do nothing. Like it just, Bingo. It, it just, it shut down. I mean, they, they looked inept. They, they had no clue what to do when T, what, T wasn't on the field. He got like a 70-yard touchdown pass called back off of some BS. Mm-hmm. I just think he's – listen, I, even myself, after the combine, there was a little bit of overreaction from me. Oh, my God, T didn't run. He didn't test. Like, I got to move him down. Wasn't, his excuse wasn't great. You know, I'm fine with him not running and not yes. not, not testing. But to be like, oh, I didn't have enough time, that was a little yes. bit – I got to admit. I mean, T's my boy. I'm a, I'm a, I went to Clemson, so I'm like – I have a hard time with all these Clemson prospects because I just want to be like, number one, number one, like take them <laughs> all. But, like, I have to like it's, – it's tough for me. I have to take a step back. But I'm with you, man. Like, I didn't, I didn't necessarily like the reasoning. But I don't mind at all the fact that he didn't do the drills, you know. And I think the reasoning really got me, you know, talking about he didn't have enough time and kind of it just sounded weak to me. It sounded weak, like he was afraid of competition. So, but when you turn on the tape, there's nothing weak about this dude's game. And a lot of people talk about him not being able to create separation for, or run routes. And I've 
I, I can go on a huge tangent about this whole route running thing because I too think that is very overrated coming out of college. I'm Look at DK not, the, one, the ones who can do it, love it. The sure. Jerry Judy's of the world, the technicians, but I can assure you, I can name Hall of Fame wide receivers who didn't run the full damn route tree. Okay, it doesn't you, go look at Calvin Johnson's name, route tree. Go look at Calvin Johnson's route tree. Andrew Hawkins from the Cincinnati Bengals ran some of the crispest, cleanest routes you will ever see, and he did absolutely nothing in the NFL and nothing for your fantasy team. But uh, there's nothing to dislike about T's game. Like, okay, he doesn't have – he's not a blazer, right? He's not going to catch a tunnel screen and take it 90 to the crib. But he's physical at the point of the catch. I think his ball tracking ability outside of C.D. Lamb, maybe a Brian Edwards, they're the top in this class. When the ball's in the air, he's going to go get it. He's physical as hell at the catch point. And he is a very good route runner. Like, I've seen him run breaking in routes. I've seen him, his out routes, you know, those five-yard five, those five yard out routes where you've mm-hmm. got to create separation. And it just looks different, man. Everybody, it, 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 he's not going to look like – Jalen Rager, because he's not 5'11", 190, 6'4", 215 pounds. Right. But I really like everything about T's game. And I think his size and the way that he wins will translate to the NFL. Like, I'm not concerned about him translating right. it to the next level. I like him a lot. Yeah, I I slightly edged. I had I was in love with Mims. I had Mims up there at, at five, and I'm with you. I, I slipped him back once I started really honing back in on, on Higgins a little bit because I – I kind of agree, man. Like, I, th- I think one – when Mims has the ball in his hands, I just don't see – like, he's not quite like – as like a dog when Higgins has the ball. In, like, I mean, just – I know it's just, it's one play, but go back to the national championship. They ran a reverse to T. Higgins, and he just – he outruns somebody to the corner, sheds off a blocker, and then runs over somebody going into the end zone. Like, I understand it's a national championship, and it's L- but LSU, the, that's a bunch of top-notch athletes on the other end of that. And, you know, you can say what you want about Clemson not playing whoever in the ACC or whatever, but, I mean, he's shown up in, in a lot of big games. He played pretty well against Arnett and, and uh, Akuda in the game before, yep. and he played pretty well against some really good D-backs in that uh, national championship game. And like you said, I mean, that Clemson offense went – was a shell of itself when he left that field. Um, and he made – obviously, you're playing with one of the best prospects that the – that we've seen in a long time at your quarterback position, but a lot of like, there's a lot of times where he makes him look good. Like yep. he's, he adjusts to the ball in the air, like you're saying, and plucks it out of the air. Cause it was a little behind him and it was a little off target. Didn't drop a ton of balls. He had a couple of drops there, but I think nine games in, he hadn't dropped a single ball. I think he's got pretty strong hands. I think his route running is good. Um, I like his after the catch. He's not a burner. Like you said, I think he can get separation. And I think a lot of these big guys at the next level, like, it's not you're not going to get a lot of separation on the next level, regardless. So if they can get a half a step, and then their size is the separation. Um, did, did anybody care about Des Bryant not getting separation when he was dropping 13 touchdowns a season? Right. I mean, it just there's different ways to win. There's so many ways to win at the next level, and if you're expecting Stephon Diggs level of route running precision out of T Higgins and you're fooling yourself from the jump. And I, I say, it's not just one play. I mean, that play in the national championship game, he had every, there are a lot of wide receivers who would have just tiptoed out of bed. He was right there on the sideline, right? What, six, four, two, fifteen receiver yeah. runs in reverse like that. I'm about to put my shoulder down, run you over and then go into the end zone like that just shows his mentality man i just right. i'm a big fan of his game i think he's going to be a big time value in 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 rookie drafts because there are people who are soured on him but well he's just I'm mike williams he's just mike williams 2.0 he's better than mike williams i, I had this so conversation with my boy and so i'm not i'm not shading mike big mike dub at all but i think he's better better wide receiver prospect than mike williams yeah i think he's quicker than mike yeah, he doesn't have that elite long speed, but I think he's fast enough. I mean, yeah. and a lot of the things I like about Mims, he does really well too. Like he beats press coverage and he's physical and makes contested catches. And like uh, sometimes he needs to bring that ball. He needs to tuck that ball in after the catch. There's just a fair amount of like he catches it and keeps it held out there in front of him and gets swatted a little bit. But I mean, I think I think uh, he he's a hard working dude. He's he's humble. He's He's gonna come in and work real hard. So I'm 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 loving some T. Higgins. I'm trying to get him where I can. I, I agree. I think he'll be a little bit of a value, but we'll see what happens on this week with the draft. So never know. 
Yeah. So I got, I got Rager at five. That's where I'm, I'm putting Rager, but I'm really in, like Jay Wayne said, I'm really interested to see what's going on. Jay Wayne, who you got at five? Uh, I got Higgins there at five. Okay. I got Higgins at four. So that's the next guy. So let's carry you into that. You got uh, Justin Jefferson at four. Mr. Four TD game himself, Justin Jefferson. And uh, I'll just say, I think the biggest, I'm not going to say question mark, but just questions is in this draft is around all those LSU players. And I'm talking about even Jamar Chase. Like I'm just, listen, I, I've taken some heat on Twitter. All I'm saying is these same guys were there in 2018 and they didn't do a fraction of what happened in 2019 when Joe Brady got there. So could Jefferson be a product of that Joe Brady offense? Could Burrow, could Clyde, could Jamar Chase, Thad Moss, Terrace Marshall? If you're not asking the question, I think you're being too naive. I'm not saying you need to believe that's true, but there, that is a question, but, but, the, the reason why I'm so high on Jefferson is it wasn't just 2019. In 2018, if you look at his age-adjusted production, I mean, he commanded the highest market share of receiving yards and receptions on that team as a true sophomore after doing jack crap as a freshman, right? right. I think he had, didn't even register accounting stat as a freshman, and then he has over 50 receptions and 800-something yards as a true sophomore, and again, hit those analytical thresholds from a market share production. So he did show that he could be productive uh, without being on the greatest offense we've ever seen in college football. But what did he do? 1,500 receiving yards, 111 receptions, 18 TDs. I mean, he was just Mr. Reliable for Joe Burrow. And uh, I think he is one of the safest wide receivers in this class. I just think that wherever he goes, you're looking at he's got a solid floor with massive upside. I think he's just a safe, good wide receiver. He's going to be good in the real football for an NFL club, and he's going to be good for your fantasy team. Yeah. And, I mean, and then a lot of the people question his athleticism, right? Like, how athletic is he? And then he went out there and completely wrecked the combo. Blew it up. Uh, when he ran a 4 four two four four, I, I had no clue because he was timed coming out of high school. He had a verified 40 time, verified at 488. That's what I, so. For me, I was hoping a four six. I was like, if he runs a four six, that's solid. He'll be a second round pick. Then he runs four four two, and I was like, shit. I mean, yeah. he's not falling out of the first now. Right. I got him up uh, at, at three, uh, a little higher because of what you said. I, I feel like him and Judy are just really safe. They really project well at the next level for what the NFL is. Both of them can play. Uh, Jefferson can play in the slot. And then, like you said, in 18, he played in the slot some, but he played a lot more outside. And, you know, he, he had some decent success. Were there times where he struggled uh, getting off some jams here or there? But for the most part, he was – pretty good playing outside so he can do both and he's probably going to fit a little bit more in the slot at the next level he absolutely just crushed the slot um in college and lsu and yeah we spent a lot of time last week talking with matt waldman just about you know grading players when they're you know, how you take into account the all these different situations um of you know where you play like if you're at alabama or lsu or ohio state and your offensive line's good and all the skill position players are good and um, I know uh, Waldman really likes this guy uh, in Jefferson, and I think I think he's just super safe. So I would I'd move him up a spot at three. Um, Jay Wayne, yeah, I got him right here at four. Uh, I think I think like everything you guys said, he seems pretty safe. I think the slot position is is kind of on the up in the NFL. You're starting to see a lot more dynamic players coming into that position. You know, like. We were, we were huge Doug Baldwin's fans for forever. Obviously, Julian Edelman's doing his thing. Cooper Cup is out there scoring mad touchdowns. Jarvis, we love Jarvis probably more than anybody. Um, so, I mean, I think that 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 he he's a he's a safe technician that that, that can come in there with a the, with a strong floor, like you said, Ray. But then also a big upside. I mean, he's he was charted. PFF had him force after the catch. Had him forced twenty five missed tackles, which was like fourth most in the nation. Average six point four yards after the catch per reception, um, but was number one in the nation in slot yards and receptions. Didn't, didn't drop a ton of balls compared to how many targets he was thrown. He's just, he's so amazing on those option routes. He just lulls you to sleep and then 
it's just sudden and quick after being patient. It's just, he checks pretty much a lot of the boxes. The only thing is, you know, can he get off the press? Can he play, play physical? But they, they PFF charted him with 93.1% contested catch rate, which was the best in the nation, which I was pretty surprised to see that. But I mean, I can't, I mean, that's, that's a good stat right there. Yeah. And, and for me, he really play style and comps. Like I don't, when I make comps, a lot of people, it's like high end shit, right? Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins. Like I see Jefferson as like a, probably a more, he is a more explosive version of Tyler Boyd. And Tyler Boyd is just that safe wide receiver at the next level. Like he's a wide receiver two with wide receiver one upside. And this whole thing about like the slot being a down, like, NFL teams are drafting corners who specialize in the slot because the slot position is so damn dangerous because you don't have to, you can't press them. They're off the line. Right. And Waldman, one of his lines was you don't go to the hardware store, buy a hammer and try to use it as a screwdriver. Let them fucking let them play in the slot, man. I mean, you you got (laughs) a slot receipt. He, Yes, he can play outside, but he's lethal when he's in there and he can run those option routes and he can use his technique. But he really reminds me of a juiced up version of Tyler Boyd, who I absolutely love. Love, love, love it, man. That's where I'm at. I like him. Like I said, I liked him a little higher because he's safer and I think there's a decent ceiling, a a pretty good ceiling built in there. Um, So let's move to your number three prospect. Who you got? Jerry Judy. Jerry Judy. Jerry Judy. Judy. Right, Alabama. I mean, most technical wide receiver in the class. I mean, he's he's not going to – if someone gets his hands on – if a DB gets – when a DB gets their hands on him, it might be a little problem, right, for him to learn. But, I mean, he's just smooth. He's explosive. He's a dynamic playmaker when he gets the ball in his hands. Uh, the production, sophomore season, over 1,300 receiving yards, won the Bolitnikoff Award as the top receiver in the nation. He's a high five-star recruit. And then again, this season where Alabama was kind of up and down, I think he still finished with over 1,100 receiving yards. I don't care that he didn't hit 30% market share. I don't care about any of that. It's Look not, at the four dudes around him. Like, good luck yeah. hitting 30% share. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. It wasn't like he just disappeared, right? Like right. somebody else on that offense. He was still like the guy. Yeah. Uh, I think he's I think he's another safe, safe wide receiver with high upside if, if – Three years from now, we're talking about Jerry Judy being one of the best wide receivers in in, in football. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. He's just yeah. just a fluid athlete. He's smooth. I would love to see a little more diversity in his skill set. I wish he can do a couple of things that number one and number two for me can do. Jerry Judy never – he never was – maybe he's never asked to do it. Maybe he's not good at it. But I wish he was a little more dynamic and there were some other things that he can do and contribute on offense. But – you're drafting a wide receiver to play wide receiver and not do a whole bunch of other stuff. So I like Judy, man. It's just like you said, you're drafting Judy to be the hammer and you're going to hammer nails in with him. You're not going to screw some siding in with some screws. Yep. All right, man. Uh, Jay Wayne, who you got at three? Because I just said I got Jefferson. So, which I think is like basically, like if you want to call it that, a cheaper version of Jerry Judy, like that's – yeah, I got I got Mims at three. Like I said before, we talked with him. I got I got Judy at two. Um, just to keep going with Judy. Um, I I could drop him a little bit lower. I mean, it's it's just it's it's tough. It's tough to weigh. Like I feel like he's gonna be safe. Like he is safe. He's a crisp route runner. They knock him for the lack of contested catches and physicality. But my man's seven eleven. He's always open. So you're not contesting catches if you're just straight up open. And so. He's going to play a lot of slot, too, I believe. So, that that's going to help out. He's pretty ridiculous after the catch. You got to enjoy that. Um, pretty fast. The 10-yard split is in the 99th percentile. He's just violent with all of his stop and starts and jukes. And, and he's got a variety of release moves. And so, I mean, he's – so many things that he does well that I think will translate. And, and, and then I mean, he, the name capital, you know, he's going to go as a high draft pick. People love him. If you take him in your dynasty draft, even if he doesn't have a great first year, he's still going to hold value. I believe because he's Jerry Judy and he's just, they're going to make excuses for him. There's players in this game who don't have to play well and still get the carry value. And if he does play well, then it's going to explode. So I'm, I'm, right. I'm all for taking Jerry Judy. Um, and I got him at number two right now. I heard he was a bit of uh, not very bright. 
but we'll see how that, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that matters. Like, I, I don't know how all that stuff matters, but somebody like, I think it's Scout, and they weren't being funny. They were like, he's barely literate. Like, he's he's not bright whatsoever, but he can catch a football, and he can yeah. run routes really well. And I think that if Judy, if, if a team drafts him and plays him in the slot, it's going to be a problem. Like, I think he's going to be just – it's going to be ridiculous if if that's his kind of primary role, but can still split out because his, a lot of people talk about acceleration, how fast somebody is from start to go. I like Jerry Judy's deceleration. I think he decelerates better than anybody in this class. And that makes a big difference when you're going 60 miles an hour and can stop on a dime. Yeah. There's not 10 chop steps to exactly. He decelerates better than anybody in this class. It's it's insane to watch how he moves. It's it's unreal. Yeah, and I'm like if he does anything where there's where there's like a post corner, anything where there's kind of two concepts involved, he's always open. I've, I haven't yes. seen him covered on anything with like a double move involved in in the route. Yeah. Um, so that's a way to get him open downfield. Some pretty bad uh, drops in there that are usually there, like would have been touched. There are down. some shitty drops, but oh then he, he usually does come back and make make a decent <laughs> catch. LSU versus LSU, he drops a bomb for a touchdown, and then catches a corner into that little. Yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Well, here we go. We're at number two. <laughs> um, yeah. I think you're probably one of the highest on this guy, and. I, I think I see what you see in being there's, I think there's a lot of upside with this guy. This guy's feet are so quick and they're so, um, so tell me, tell me what you think about. Well, you pu- why don't y'all pop it off? Why don't y'all, what, what is it? Why is Rager fifth for you, Jay? And why I don't, where, where, why don't y'all tell me what you don't like about it's, Rager? So it's basically, like you said, so we have all these guys. It's when I'm splitting hairs here, it feels like most of these guys above them feel a little bit safer to me, but the upside for Rager is through the roof. Like I'm, I want to put Rager on my team because I think there's, there's so much juice there. Um, but I think I would – I feel a little bit more confident taking most of these guys ahead of them because I feel like they're just a little bit safer prospects. Is that fair? Like, I mean, when I look at him, he, he might be the most subtle, sudden dude in this – when you watch him move around on the field. Like, the suddenness of, of Rager is ridiculous. Like I said, I think his feet are really quick and they're really smooth. He has ridiculous circus sketches followed by some kind of stupid drops, but – whatever he had, he struggled with like he came in there I, was it kj hill his freshman year is that who was his quarterback kenny trill kenny trill kenny, kenny hill yeah. yeah came in there and had a ridiculous a ridiculously efficient freshman year and absolutely lit it up and then just played with a bunch of different trash can like he was okay the next year and this year like they chart when you chart all of his stuff and and you see the numbers that come back and he has all these low percentages of things. It's like, well, they did a terrible job of scheming him with short stuff, which should have been all day long because he's ridiculous if you can get the ball in his hands. And then half the time, like after he catches, he's having to come back to balls or wait on balls, or it's just like there's a lot of things that aren't weren't really in his control uh, this last year from just basically having a trash can for a quarterback. Um, so I, I really I see a lot of upside there, but I'm I'm a little concerned about. Uh, the floor, like it might, I, I could see him busting is basically the, like, and I feel a little bit better about these other guys is really what holds me back from keeping him up any higher. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's a fair assessment of, of Rager, um, you know, but looking at it in, on the opposite end of the spectrum, I think he's the most dynamic wide receiver in this class. I think what he can do, he and CeeDee Lamb, who's number one for me, no surprise, uh, if if there's no training camp, if let, let, screw all that, all things equal, if all of these guys have to learn how to adjust to defensive backs at the NFL, they have to learn how to win with separation. If all of them have kind of that equal playing field, right, that adjustment level, the one thing that Rager can do that everybody in this class outside of CeeDee Lamb really has never shown an ability to do, and that's contribute on special teams, and in particular the punt return game, and it's a big – that's big for me because returning points is the single hardest play in football, period. There's no harder position to play outside a punt returner. And when you look at the career of Tyreek Hill, and I'm not comparing Jalen Rager to Tyreek Hill. I've got a different comp for Rager. 
what kind of sparked Tyreek Hill uh, Tyreek Hill's ascension at the NFL? It was punt returns. I mean, he was returning. It felt like he was returning a kick or a punt every week. And then all of a sudden, he started to get integrated into Kansas City's offense little by little. Rager was not only a dynamic return man. He carried the ball out of the backfield. I think outside of T. Higgins, he's the best 50-50 ball receiver in this class, and he's only five foot eleven. It's ridiculous what he can do with the ball in the air. It's it's insane. And he went to the combine and he, I mean, he jumped 42 inches in the vertical jump. Um, you know, it's it's funny that a f- when we look at a four four seven and think that's somehow slow, I right. think part of that was my hype. I, I hyped him up a little too much and people probably thought that he was going to run. And I even thought that he was going to challenge rugs as the fastest receiver. And his whole combine is like an interesting paradox because he runs a four four seven, jumps forty two inches, and has almost the furthest broad jump in out of anybody at the combine. But then his lateral agility drills were fucking one percentile, right? Just like dog shit. Yeah, why even run the three cone and the twenty yard shuttle if you're Rager? You know why even? Like he has to know that we talk about that a lot. Like there's no way that he didn't do that beforehand, right? He has to know that they weren't coming back. Like why not? Just why? Why not do it? Like why just be like, hey, we're but not doing that. But the thing with that is. I think, and there were some people who charted those lat- those three cones and 20-yard shuttles. Like, historically, they said this was, like, one of the slowest times for any position in those lateral agility drills in the past, like, For, for the years. receivers, you mean? Yes, for the Yeah, receivers. there was a lot of bad, bad times. Yeah, and is that because they were doing it at 10 o'clock at night? I don't know, because Denzel Mims ran a 666, so I mean, <laughs> Michael Pittman was sub-7. But right. I, I, I think Rager's dynamic ability – he just fits today's NFL where a lot of things are manufactured for the wide receiver. Tunnel screens, he's money. Jet sweeps, money. Throw it downfield, money. Double moves, money. I, I mean, is there some risk? But the problem is that, that, that what I counter is he's going to get day one draft capital. He's, he's getting drafted on Thursday. Mark my word. So when you're t- looking at these wide receivers – the only four out of these six that I'm pretty confident are going to go drafted in the first round are four through one. And draft capital matters. Like, I, I care more about draft capital than landing spot. A.J. Brown taught me a very valuable lesson last year that I don't even care about landing spot anymore, uh, especially for wide receivers. So, uh, with the perceived draft capital, with his athleticism, with the dynamism that he possesses, I feel really, really good with having the upside of Jalen Rager, which I think is – I, I, I've comped him to a more explosive version of Percy Harv, and I've had that comp for him for over a year and a half, and that's who I see his game as. Like that's that's what I see. So last uh, one one quick uh, thing last year, like Hollywood Brown gets drafted high. I don't know where you had him. Let's say like a guy like KJ Hamler gets drafted in the first round for some reason because he's really fast. Does that change your opinion on him? It ain't happening. I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm not even going to, <laughs> I'm not even going to entertain it because it's not happening. It's not happening. But it, for the purpose of the exercise, <laughs> if a KJ Hamler goes in the first round, I'm still not touching him. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, Jay Wayne, what's your thoughts on Rager or how you feeling over there? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to get excited about with Rager. I, I can't, I can't deny that. I mean, he's, I, He's definitely looks super. He looks faster than his forty. I didn't do the research. I'm assuming he wasn't a track star, so maybe that. And 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 I don't think you're like incorrect, Ray, with assuming he was going to run a super fast forty just from looking at the tape. On the one hand, and then also they were talking about how he was charted at a, at a four two nine coming into college or something like that, and everybody was saying he was the fastest player in the Big Twelve. And um, so I mean. He made a mistake putting on 11 pounds. Like, I just – I don't know why he did that. Um, maybe I – don't, I don't know why. But they list him at 195. He checks in at 206. I don't think that was wise. And you see he's already dropped weight. He's back down to 195, I think, at his – or 198 at his virtual pro day, which I'm not even concerned about. But, you know, and, and, and one of the things that I did mention is he had the lowest catchable target rate in college football – um, he played with six different quarterbacks in three years. It's it just TCU was just it was bad. Like it was bad. There were three games in 2019 where he wasn't targeted 
targeted into the third quarter. And I think there were two games where a wide receiver, any wide receiver on the Horn Frogs offense, they didn't catch a pass until the five minute mark in the second quarter. I mean, it's just, and even then, even with that happening, his age adjusted production, he still had the highest market share 18, receptions. Something. Yeah, uh, his breakout age, 18 years yeah. old. Market share receptions in 2019, over 25%. I mean, he still was the guy on a shit team, but he was still the guy. Right. He yeah, certainly got to love that college dominator. And, and, and real quick, Case, I, I, I don't want to discount him at all for any kind of lack of production. Like, I was a little stunned to see the yards after the catch that he put down, but then it's like he wasn't given that much of an opportunity to get the yak. So, I mean, and you can see how much yak he can get on a punt return. So, I, I'm with you there. It's just the, the minute I would start to get real excited about Rager, I would see a terrible drop. And it was usually like over the middle. And then, and then I'd be like, okay, I can, I can get, I can get down with some drops. Everybody drops a ball, you know, maybe he's frustrated. It's bad quarterback play. And then, then he, they ever seem like he kind of loses his balance a lot. Like he, he the turf monster yeah. seems to get yeah, him. He's got to get some new cleats. Yeah. He's got to get some new cleats. He's got to get some new, he's got to get some new cleats because there were some plays where he's just slipping. Um, and, and that could be, that could be problematic and, 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 and talks and, and yield to something else. But when you talk about dog, I mean, I don't know if you guys know his father was a second round pick, uh, won a Super Bowl. Um, he a defensive so this, tackle or something? He, so he was yeah, a he played dude. D tackle. Yeah, yeah. Monte Rager, uh, yeah. played defensive tackle, won a Super Bowl with the Colts. I mean, this dude is a dog, man. Uh, he's just... He's he's a raw player, right? He's far from a finished product. Like Jerry Judy, way more refined than probably NFL ready. But I think Rager is going to be one of those guys where when, look at DK this year, and they're already talking about okay, we're going to open it up more for him this year. He may only run three routes year That's one. That's what I said earlier be. when you were talking about yeah. how much does the route tree matter. I said DK. Like I mean, yeah. everyone just shot all over him because he couldn't do this or that. Like. Rager Mun may only run him. three routes, but when he gets the ball, good luck getting him down and good luck catching him because he's right. a beast. Yeah, and I think basically the, the moral of the story is is like we let it off with you could really chop this up. Like I'm okay with putting Rager really almost just about anywhere. He just right now, today, the where he falls, it's more like fifth for me. I could easily have him over Higgins. I don't think I would put him over Judy or Jefferson just because I feel really safe about those two guys. Um, but I could, he could easily be four instead of five or six. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. So number one, I think everyone unanimously is in the same, uh, lane here. It's, it's CD. Um, for me, it's all his traits are just a step above everybody else's for the most part. And, and almost all facets of the game outside of, uh, probably straight line speed. I think he's a little faster than the 40 may have even let on. Uh, he is, he's basically is like the best geometry major on the fucking field. He is chopping up angles and doing shit that people aren't even seeing on the field. It's so good. His contested catches outrageous. His contact balance is ridiculous. Um, so I would put him, and if we're talking tiers, I think he's, there's a, there's a tier break at CD for me. What's your yeah. thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really don't want to exhaust the audience talking about CD. I mean, he's great and he's dynamic. He too is another one of those players with that, that dynamism. He returned punts in college. I love that with players. Uh, I like to see that he's a yak monster. He's got dog. He's physical. He's an angle beater. And I, I jokingly said he was the fastest, not that fast guy in college football because he's like, you're like, Oh, he's not that fast, but he's pulling away right. from defenders consistently. Um, true freshman year. Oh, 800 his, yards is a true freshman, right? Yeah. And I said last year, he was the best. I know Marquise Brown went in the first round. He was the one who got a lot of shine. CeeDee Lamb's been the best wide receiver on that team for the past three years. Yeah. For the past three years, he's been the best wide out. I can agree with that. Like, his his he's so good at varying his play speed throughout a play. It's ridiculous. And, just, and he's yep. always open. It's, it's crazy. Yep. And, any, and, and he, he didn't run the fastest 40, but – my God, if the whole stadium isn't feeling like he's about to house it every time he's got the ball in his hands, you just feel that electricity and he's just so dirty when he has the ball and, and going up and get it. Yeah, he checks all the boxes. We don't need to we don't need yeah. to exhaust it. Like it's I think I mean, we, his combine yeah, was kind of shitty. Like if I'm being honest, it wasn't very good. Like, but yeah, who cares? Like, uh, I didn't it doesn't care matter. He, he can play. I don't care. You turn uh, the tape on, can he play or not? He's clearly the best receiver out yes. there. Like we're good. 
Yes. So I feel you. We don't have to exhaust a lot of time. All right. So for you, it was CD at one. It was Rager at two. It was Judy at three. It was Jefferson at four. It was Higgins at five. And it was Mims at six. Correct? That's correct. I personally, I'm going CD at one, Judy at two, Jefferson at three, Higgins at four, Rager at five, Mims at six. Jay Wayne, where are you at? So I had Rager at six, um, Higgins at five, Jefferson at four, Mims at three, Judy at two, Lamb at one. Chop it up however you is, like. Is Ruggs the next guy looking in? For me, no. for sure. I, but I, I, like I said, I haven't listened no? to watched a bunch of guys, but I want to hear what you got to say, Ray. What, who you got next? Uh, he's, he's at nine for me. He's, he's nine. Uh, next up, I've got Michael Pittman Jr., eight, Brandon Ayuk, nine, Henry Ruggs, ten, Brian Edwards. I was, I was wondering how much you, you, you really crushed all this punt return and the run after the catch and being like, I feel like Ayuk is just ridiculous with the ball in his hands. So I, yep. I, I, there's no way that you weren't feeling him. And I think he might end up with some higher draft capital than yep. some people yep. think. So Draft capital matters, at least for opportunity, right? It doesn't mean that they're going to be this fantasy star, but they're going to get every, every chance in the world to be that right yeah. they're going to get G- the opportunities gms want themselves proved right so they're going to let this man Absolutely. get some opportunity and have a little bit longer of a leash for sure yep yep you got any wide receivers outside of rager that you find yourself higher on than everybody else just a quick- uh, i think Pittman jr uh, is one that i feel like i'm a little bit higher on lynn bowden jr isaiah hodgins from oregon state and uh yeah, I think that's – that's you know, Pittman Jr. is the one where a lot of people are like, that high at seven? I'm like, yeah, that high at seven. I yeah. like him a lot, like his game. I'm only a game or two into Pittman, so I can't really speak on it, but I do I do like what he does. He's a pretty big dude, and he can he can move. Yep. Seems pretty fluid. All right. Well, well Ray, we've, uh, we've had you here for – we've been rolling for like an hour on this show, man. You good to keep rolling? Let's go, man. All right. All right, well, well, we'll try to move as quick as we can through the rest of this. Um, you right, you good, Jay Wayne? Yeah, I'm good. I just, I, these shows, we always run long, and we've been bringing on guests, so I just want to be cognizant of your time and Appreciate make it a roll. Yeah. So if you, yeah, if thank you, you. run, you got your busy man. So if you need to run, I want to give you that opportunity. But if you want to keep rolling, let's keep rolling. Let's go. Let's go. All right. All right, Ray. You can check him out at Destination Devi on YouTube. Definitely go and do that. You can check him out at Ray GQ on the Twitter. Um, great follow there. Did a decent job of breaking down some wide receivers there. <laughs> um, all right, man, let's get down to s- uh, some other questions outside of these receivers. You're a, you're a guy whose roots are seated in the Debbie world. Uh, so you've naturally been watching these higher touted <laughs> prospects like Akers and Swift for, for a long time. How do you keep yourself from building a bias towards players like that? Because, I mean, they've been – up at that top for so long and I'm not saying that it's not warranted to still have them at the top, but I feel like it's easy to fall into a trap of name cache of name cache and the public being so high on them. And you know, when uh, Chubb and Sony were there, it was, Oh, wait till this Swift guy gets here. He's, he's so nat, you know, so how do you, how do you keep yourself from keep yourself in check? Really? Especially I mean, from the Debbie perspective. It's 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 accountability, right? It's I'm not afraid to put my opinions and takes out there in the public space. And uh Twitter does a good job of keeping you accountable whether you want them to or not. Uh so for me, uh, I know that I'm on acres now, but if you go back and search Ray GQ Acres, I was his biggest hater over the summer. Like I wasn't feeling him. I said, he yeah. has to show me something in 2019. And that's after being high on him as an incoming freshman in 2017. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, it's important in this industry, in this business, not to have take lock one way or the other, right? If Jalen Rager doesn't get drafted into the fourth round this week, then I'm not going to sit here and tell people you need to take him as wide receiver too. Like uh, that would just, that's not what you, that's not, it's not being a good like conduit of information for people who really rely on us. Like uh, right. in all of us on this, like right now, like it's, 
it's easy as it's easy for us to joke and talk about flip flopping and all that, but there are people who really do value our opinions, right? They really are looking towards to us for advice to help their teams. And I know a lot of people think, Oh, it's just stupid fantasy. Like, like this is what, this is real stuff for people, man. Like yeah. they, it, it's like, so it, to not have bias, it's, it's important to kind of hold yourself accountable and put it out there. So Uh, like I said, I was a big, I did a whole show on Cam Akers not feeling him. Like I was like, he's got to show me something in 2019 and what he did with the circumstances that were presented to him. I mean, he exceeded all of my expectations in 2019. So it's, it's tough, but you just got to cut the cord sometimes and be like, all right, this guy isn't it. All right. Well, I mean, we were, I was a big Hakeem Butler guy last year. And obviously, like you said, didn't go until a lot later. And I, you know, you got to change it. Like I had him as number one. He was my favorite dude. I love that guy. I still like him, but it, I wasn't telling anybody to be like, Hey, you better, you better spend that first round pick on him still. Like you got it. You can back that up now. Like you can still yep. get the dude. I mean, I'm still not, I'm still going to go to bat for him, but I'm not going to tell you that you need to draft him uh, in the, you know, first overall, second over, you know, whatever. Right. All right. Well, sell me, sell, sell me Cam Akers then, because I think me and Jay Wayne and Big Co. We're, we wouldn't. I would think he was. He's the last of all of the bigger dudes out of Taylor's, Dobbins, uh, Clyde Edwards, and Swift. I, I, we got Akers below those guys. I'm not sure if you do too, um, but Mm-mm. but sell me, sell me Akers. I know you. I think you have Dobbins uh, below all those dudes. Yeah, I got I got Akers three, Dobbins okay. four, Edwards Eglair five, and. Okay. Uh, well, it's it, pitch the, me the big, the big thing is, I mean, he's, he's a guy who had the pedigree coming in, right? He was a highly touted recruit. This was only his third year playing running back. He was a monster quarter dual threat quarterback in, in, in high school coming out of Clinton, Mississippi. Um, so the talent is all there. The physical traits and tools are all there. He went to the combine. We're going to skip the season. Went to the combine, five foot ten, two four, two seventeen, I believe, four four forty yard dash, explosive. I mean, he's built. He looks like a prototypical running back. And when you watched him in those drills, he looked probably the most fluid outside of Edwards Hilaire in those kind of bag agility drills. But then you go back to his production. It's a true freshman, over a thousand rushing yards. And then a sophomore season came and it was just bad, like yards per carry dipped. Florida State, I, we've heard and we see people talk about how bad that offensive line play was, but I don't think people truly grasp how pathetic and putrid it was. And I don't know who could have thrived back there. I mean, it is uh 900 plus yards of his 100 of his 1100 were after contact uh his offensive line was credited and I'm not even exaggerating with two positive yards gained all season that's just I mean I mean what more do people what more did we want out of Cam Akers uh yeah. you know he's Every single year in college, he hit the 20, 20 reception threshold every single year. Uh, he's a durable running back. He's a three-down threat. He is athletic. He's talented, and he played in a shit situation. So I just say get him to a mediocre offensive line, and I think you're looking at a star running back on your hands. I mean, it's, there's the only thing that I, that, that I kind of question about his game, he, he coughed the ball up a little bit, nowhere near the level that Jonathan Taylor did. But one of the underrated traits in Cam Akers' game that I love, I just love, is he's physical, right? He's a player who on third down, if you have to have him protect the blind side of your quarterback, he will absolutely rock defenders. Like, he is not afraid of contact. Something that I'm telling you right now, the worst running back in pass protection that I've seen outside of Chuba Hubbard is Clyde edwards Lair. If he's not out yeah, it's, running it's the route suspect. on third down – it's beyond suspect. Put an APB out on that dude. He is going to get your quarterback murdered. Absolutely. He has zero interest in physical contact and engaging a defender. Cam Akers has that in his game. He's got speed. He's got versatility. I, I'm, I'm very high on Cam Akers, and that's after being low on him coming into the season. All right. Well, I can, I can appreciate that. Casey, let me jump in for, for a second. Go ahead. Um, Ray was uh, – Cam Akers sophomore year wasn't that the year that their quarterback got hurt the first game of the season the big game of the season Francois yeah did yep. I mean, remember he hurt his knee or something that was yep. a big game versus Can't remember who they Bama, played Alabama yeah what? okay so Florida State potentially 
championship bound because they had the Francois, yada, 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 goes down week one. I'm a big team momentum guy. And you you maybe have championship aspirations and then you lose week one. Anytime you lose in college football, you, your chances of going goes down and then your quarterback's down too. So like you said, sophomore season wasn't there. I felt like that just took the air out of the balloon for the for the Seminoles week one, and it just, they just never they never recovered. Dude, never recovered. The entire coaching staff got cleaned out. It was the year after Jimbo Fisher left. It just they just weren't. And it, and it blows my mind that a team like Florida State they don't have competent backups. You know, a competent quarterback at, to to back up Francois. Right. How are you not recruiting legitimate offensive? It just Clemson took the ball, baby. They were bad, 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 yeah. and bad. They stink. Yeah, there was a, that was a terrible situation, and it, and it wasn't it was it was it was hard to watch get through all the tape on Acres because it was just like Jesus. It is, is. Yeah. It's a testament it's, it's, to him. He's just getting blown up and blown up in the line, so, and then all of a sudden he busts off a sixty yard touchdown run. It's. I was gonna say if you if you want to watch three and four yard runs, Cam Acres is the tape for you because that's about all you're getting outside yeah, that, the. Then, then there'll State. be like one great run on there where he does it himself and takes off. Yep. Yep. And uh, I would, I would say he might maybe he seeks out contact a little too much, for my yeah. taste. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you, you sometimes gotta learn. he's running into the back of people and then running, running, running into con. Like maybe, maybe tone it down a hair. He's gonna, he's gonna have to learn. He's gonna yeah. have to. But that's all coachable stuff, right? Sure. That's that's sure. stuff that will will he'll get better at his time. I mean, hell, even Ronald Jones looked better this year than he did yeah. his his first year in the NFL. Yeah, we talked about Miles Sanders last week, which I think um, I feel kind of Cam Akers is a little bit like Miles Sanders in where he, he might, I feel like maybe he still has parts and pieces to really learn of the running back game. That's the same way I felt about Miles Sanders. It was a really tough evaluation for me because I couldn't put my – there's a lot of great stuff going on, but it just seemed like he was always the best athlete on the field. So maybe never quite had to hone in some of those nuances of the running back position. And then you saw, just like you were saying with coaching – Philly got a hold of him. Their running backs, he was – Miles Sanders was not good to start the season. Running backs all went away, and then the running back coach and all the other coaches got a hold of him, and you saw such growth out of Miles Sanders last year. So I, I think you're absolutely right as far as coaching, which I don't think enough people put stock into going into the situations and the coaching and, and, and the scheme and all that stuff that you play with is, is so critical in these guys' development in the next stage of their game. And I just want to say one more thing. Akers had every – reason every built-in excuse to phone it in in 2019 right or like transfer I'm gonna, yeah i'm gonna phone it in this team is garbage i'm getting killed and he just went out there and i mean i'm very impressed with the numbers that he put up and yeah. i mean he was i know it's just raw data but 300 yards less rushing than Clyde edwards elaire on the worst offensive line in college football i mean it's I was very impressed with with what he did this season. Very impressed by by Akers. All right, fair enough. We're going to move to another running back here. We just had Matt Waldman on. He really likes AJ Dillon. Um, you, you do not, uh, obviously. He made your all avoid list over there on Twitter and on DLF. You have him pretty low. What's the cause behind the hate there? What's is what you got? What what's your beef with As, Dillon? As as the pod father, uh, Matt Kelly himself says, I don't hate players. I hate player ADP. And I'm not touching A.J. Dillon with the he top He didn't invent that. Pick. Let me just tell you that. Did he, did he not invent that? Well, he no, says it a lot. Of course he, he says does. it a lot, right? <laughs> but, Speaks um, a lot of things into truth that aren't true. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just I'm not, I'm not spending top 12 draft capital on what I believe is going to be a two-down grinder at best at the next level. Like, I don't see – can any of us envision? Can he, can he catch the football? I think sure. he can catch the ball. Yeah. Okay, you can catch the football. I can catch the football. I think he can catch the football, but I, I think there's a big difference between catching the football and being deployed as a pass catching weapon, which I believe he will never be. That he will never be split out to go right. He's 250 pounds. Like. I mean, they did again, split him out a couple of times at Boston College. He does. He did have some decent hands where there was some people in his face and he and he snagged the ball all right i'm not saying he's a great pass catcher and i'm not saying he's clyde edwards alaire because they're two completely different players 
But if you're going to tell me that if, like we talked about it last week, if what if A.J. Dillon goes to Baltimore and Ingram's num- days are numbered and you, you can tell they want to pound the rock? Or what if he goes to Tennessee and you got to wait out Henry for a year and they don't want to pay him? Like what if the situation lines up where he's no longer a two-down grinder, he's, he's, the, he's the feature of the offense? Then I will happily draft him in the standard leagues that I don't play in. Because he's still not going to be <laughs> somebody that I want in PPR. How formats. many? How many? If, he, if how many catches does Derrick Henry have to have to be that? All he needs to do is catch a cut like three checkdowns a game. Like he doesn't have to be the elite receiver that everybody you know is. I, I get it. That's what you want in dynasty and and out of your but players. Every, that's what you want out of all your players. You want them to be able to be elusive out of the backfield, but that's not everybody's game. Like, look at Leonard Fournette this year. He caught a ton of passes. Like, targets. Nobody, nobody yeah. thought he could catch the ball. Nobody thought Nick Chubb could catch the ball. Nobody – like, Ezekiel Elliott was never pegged as being this receiving threat. He still catches a decent amount of balls a year. Like, it doesn't have to be, like, the, the big part of your game. Of course it's a bonus if you're – uh, a guy who can do all of those things to give your Saquon Barkley. Sure. If you're Christian McCaffrey and you could be a slot receiver. Sure. But I mean, I think, I think it's, I think he does a okay. lot of things really well. Okay. <laughs> but I feel Henry, you on the ADP. Though. Henry, I do feel you on the ADP. Derrick Henry, Leonard Fournette. Who else did you name? Nick Chubb. What other big Zeke. running back did you name? Zeke, Zeke Elliott. You're naming the top fucking running backs in the NFL. There's a big difference between AJ Dillon and those guys. I think your more your more likely scenario is you've got a player who is not the rusher, the the rusher that a Nick Chubb, that a Zeke Elliott, that a Leonard Fournette is. I think AJ so Dillon is. Why can't a he be? A, why steps. can't he be in the Derrick Henry realm where you do where Derek you Henry. finally feature him and you're going to grind the ball out? Because he's not Derrick Henry. Mm, I would. He's disagree. not Derrick Henry. I, I do not think he is the rusher. I don't think he is the athlete that – not the athlete because he's very athletic. To be 250 pounds, very athletic, very explosive, not taking any of that away from him. I think you use him in that role. If you're saying that he's going to be the Mark Ingram hammer, right, great. I think that's a good role for him. I just think the upside I, – I, a lot of people, I see them saying Derrick Henry. I just don't see that level of rusher – that I see in Derrick Henry, and even then, it took us what year four to well, get this out saying. of Derrick Henry. It took it took him to be the featured player of the offense, and that's what I'm saying. Like if he goes yeah. to a role where he can be that guy, like I think he can really succeed. Like he could be that, or he could be Jordan Howard. I you think the I, mean? I think the I think. If and I, I like Jordan have, Howard. I think that's a, yeah. I think that's a good player to have on your squad as as some depth. Like Jordan Howard dropped a bunch of balls one year, but he had a decent couple of seasons where he caught more a decent Absolutely. amount. It wasn't anything crazy, and and he can run between the tackles. And I think I think AJ Dillon's got some some very sweet feet. I think he's got a lot of power to his game. I think he's got good vision. See, I think I think, I think he good, to think be as big as he is pieces. As big as he is, he's not. He is, and I don't care about that run where he stiff armed the dude to the ground. If you go watch AJ Dillon, he is, is to be two fifty. That dude is not nearly as physical as I'd like him to be. Not at all. Like he, yeah, but see, he's he's nimbler than you would think he would be. Right. He's he's got a, he's got another part to his game because if he was just that guy who was two fifty and ran as hard as he could and just hit the hole, y'all boys would be bitching about like, oh, he's just two fifty. He's just this dude who runs into the line and he just uses his size. He's just power, like. He's got more than that to his game, and he does have the ability to finish with power drink. <laughs> where do y'all got him ranked at? I got him ten. I don't think I don't, that's. I, I don't. Where, I don't think ten is like disrespect. Where, I got him. Where, I got him. So I got I got Taylor Dobbins, Clyde Edwards, Swift, Acres, and then right below those two guys, I got Dylan and, and Moss probably are around in the okay, same. Okay, so area. what? What's that? Like seven? You got six, him seventh? Seven. Yeah, six. Yeah, six seven. Okay. Just and, and you know, obviously, <laughs> obviously all, like Taylor Dobbins, C- Clyde Edwards, and Swift, I want those guys on my team for sure. I'm taking them in the top half of the first round, bar none for the most part. And then now A.J. Dillon at the end of the round after some of these receivers that we just went and we get into that third tier of receivers, now I'm interested in taking A.J. Dillon. Like there's a lot of these receivers that I feel really good about that we just talked about that I would definitely rather have than A.J. Dillon on my team. Unless he lands in a spot like, you know, uh, like we just talked about Baltimore, or maybe he lands in Tennessee, Tennessee because they franchised it 
old boy and they just, Hey, we're going to load this up with a cheaper guy. And you know, if the landing spot's great, then I could maybe start justifying, but I don't get, we don't get super caught up in landing spot like crazy over here. Um, Yeah. Try not anyway. So that's when TJ Duckett is just a two down grinder, we'll (laughs) we'll get back on the show. We'll we'll, we'll recall this one, but I I get it, man. He is to be that big. He is an explosive athlete. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. All right. I think one of the we're coming around early in his AJ (laughs) Dillon though. He was talking about draft capital. Like if you put yourself in a rookie draft, um, and I'm talking about what Ray said just now. So like, and then Casey alluded to it as well. Like the biggest thing about it is if, if the situation is not right, uh, if, if your NFL team is losing, AJ Dillon is not going to be on the field. So he's not going to get you any points for your fantasy team. If the situation is not right, you don't want to have that type of person, that type of player in the wrong situation. So like, I, I think, you know, you guys are both kind of going in the right direction. There's too many good wide receivers that are safer, that are good assets, that are no matter what going to be going to hold value and likely gain value as this thing plays out. If A.J. Dillon finds himself in the right situation in one of those A-plus situations, then we can really talk about where he's going to be in the back half of the first round. But if he doesn't, because even if he does find himself in one of those situations, obviously running backs get injured quickly in NFL because that's what happens. But if he's behind, if he's behind Derrick Henry, he's behind Derrick Henry until next year. If he's behind Mark Ingram, he's behind Mark Ingram until he gets hurt or next year. Um, you know, just because I mean, first of all, because the running backs gonna, I mean, because the uh, the quarterbacks gonna take half the rushing attempts in Baltimore. But um, you know, there's I think there's there's room for AJ Dillon in a rookie draft. But you got to get past some of that upside in the wide receiver, the value department, and some of those wide receivers first. Yeah, I agree. So, how many times have we been playing fantasy right, and you're barely winning, and then the Patriots or some fucking team like that gets the ball with three minutes left, and then James White, who you're playing sure. against, is on the field, and somehow in two minutes he accumulates five receptions for sixty something yards for sure. Eleven hey, here it is. PPR points. Here it is. It was Danny Woodhead. It was Woodhead on the Chargers. That was my boy, and he kept he kept, he would get he would get five catches in a, in a row before <laughs> halftime or at the end of the game. And that's and even with Derrick Henry, even with Nick Chubb, that's the frustrating part is when, when you need those receptions, right? Derrick Henry's not going to be on the field in the two minute drill. Like he like we beg, like we're praying, please just put twenty two in the game. If you're losing, and it's and it's if you're losing, and it's Deion Lewis, right? So, um, but you know, conversely, if the game script is right. Derrick Henry's on the field and he'll, he can take eight straight carries, right? And pick up 60 something yards. So I, listen, I get it. I'm and a bigger TD to, upside. I'm prepared to be wrong on AJ Dillon. Oh. Uh, I, I'm in that, and that's fine though, because I put it out there. I just, the, the, I just don't like to chase those archetypes. I would prefer something else. So I feel you. And I, I, I was hesitant on both. A, I'm more hesitant on Zach Moss. Uh, and I've been, and I'm, I'm hesitant on both of those guys because in the past, I've definitely been a little bit more bullish on those style of guys, and it, I've definitely w- weaned off of it a little bit. But I think AJ Dillon's a little different. Um, that's that's really sure. my only. And, and like I said, I'm not going to go ahead. It's all about ADP, and and yeah. I agree with you. Um, all right, so all right, 2021 and beyond. Let's get into your wheelhouse here. Who are you fired up about? Let me say something real quick. Let me say something real quick. I got, I'm, I'm about to hit our Patreon people real hard this week. There's a, there's a really, really good chance we don't have college football this year. And I'm, it's a serious business. There's a really, really, because these, these boys aren't getting paid. You, how in the world are you going to put these student athletes on the, together to blood, sweat, and tears on a football field with this virus, and you can't even – you don't have any idea who's got it. We still can't test right, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, there's a lot of time between now and when the kickoff needs to happen, but if they don't have college football this year, I'm about to lean on you, Ray. I, the Debbie guys are about to be more important than ever because I'm not a college. I do. I am a college football fan. I work a lot of Saturdays. I'm a Gamecock fan. So it's been real easy the last couple of years to lose <laughs> a little interest. It's been real easy to lose a little interest. It's been a long time since we went, we, we won 11 games, three straight years. But if we don't have college football this year, 
I can't wait to, for you to tell me who you like already because it's going to be my 2021 draft picks are going to be mm, really hard to figure out what to do with. Are you from South Carolina? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we what, all live in Charleston. Oh, I was born in South Carolina, man. All right. Yep. We all live like five minutes from each other. We usually was, do this at, at our house with all three together, but obviously the circumstances right now. I was born in Orangeburg. Oh, oh shit, yeah. that's real close. That's right down the yeah, street. I was born in, yeah, yeah, I got my grandparents live uh, out there. So, yeah, cool. I mean, I got it fucking tattooed on my arm right here, man. <laughs> um, didn't, I was just born there, like literally. Yeah. Mom just was passing through with my grandmas and I pop, I came out. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, it's this whole 2021 thing is scary, uh, you know, and and if there is a college season, I mean, we're just, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but there's some talented, talented ass players in 2021, man. I mean, we, we, we were joking before we got live talking about the next year's class is always yeah. better than the year before, right? Oh, wait till but the next I'm, year. Wait till the next year, though. Right. But I've, I, I said this pre-2020, like once all the declarations were going on, I was like, man, if, in capital I, capital F, everybody who's 2021 eligible, if they come out, which we know some of them have no choice, like Devonta Smith, Tylen Wallace, they're all seniors, so they have to come out. Jamar Chase, is, Jamar Chase is going to come out because LSU receivers always come out after their junior year. Um, but it could be – so much better than what we have in 2020 and I'm talking about from the high end to the to the back end I mean Jamar Chase of course Rondell Moore I think Rashad Bateman is going to give them a money uh, run for their money as a top receiver in that class you've got Tamari on Terry out of Florida State Devonta Smith Tylen Wallace Sage Surratt Warren Jackson uh, I, I mean, I can just uh, – and those are just receivers. Quarterbacks, we're looking at two. The number one overall pick is going to be Trevor Lawrence. The number two overall pick is probably going to be Justin Fields. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's just – and then when you go running back, that's the part where it's a little – I'd say it's a little down from 2020. Uh, my top three guys, uh, Chuba Hubbard, Travis Etienne, and Najee Harris – uh, at the running back positions, followed by Max Borgie out of Washington State. And just because he's a white running back, that does not mean he is Danny Woodhead. That does not mean he's just a third <laughs> Christian down McCaffrey. Christian, oh, God. Uh, white running back, Christian McCaffrey, Danny Woodhead. Those are the comps. <laughs> Black running back that's thin with dreads and wears 25 is Jamal, Jamal Charles. Charles yeah. yeah, I mean, these it, it physical comps, the laziest shit I've ever seen. Max Borgie is not Christian McCaffrey. He's Max Borgie, and he's damn good. Um, but the running backs are a step down for me in 2021. But the, the tight ends, like we don't even have to discuss tight ends in 2020. Punt and wait till 2021. You got Pat Fryermuth out of four, uh, Penn State, uh, Kyle Pitts out of Florida, Brevin Jordan, Charlie Kohler out of Iowa State. I mean, it's just, it's going to, and I'm just talking about the offensive side of the ball. Um, yeah. It's, I'm really excited for 2021. But not having a college season, ugh, I mean, Gosh, I guess you just late if if that and I think that's a very real possibility, man. Like these are student athletes; these aren't pros. So that's what I'm saying, they don't get paychecks, and they, the million dollar, the millionaire NFL players, they can take that risk. They's like, you, hey, you want to go out there and play ball? We'll put you up in Montana, some stadium nobody's ever heard of, and, and right. play some NFL, maybe you know, to keep you out of risk, and we can actually all still make our money. But in college. I don't. It's, yeah, I got it less than fifty fifty right now. I've really studied up on this. I've really been big on studying this virus crap, and <laughs> I, I got I got it less than fifty fifty having a college season. I feel like they're gonna push it somehow. Like I, I still feel like it's gonna happen, whether that's with it in the best interest of the the players or not. But. It's a very real possibility. And if you are one of those top players, just say Trevor Lawrence. What if he's just like. I know I'm going to be the top pick. I don't want to get sick. Like, you know, True. I'm just going to chill. Like, I'm, I'm not risking it. I'm, I'm just not. That. There will be players who do that. Hands down. There will be players who are like, the hell with this. Yeah, like, I've got a million dollars waiting know, on me. I don't even know how this really works, but I heard somebody say this. It might have been one of our Patreon Dynasty Leagues. Um, the Can't you still 
for the supplemental draft? Can't like ETN still say, oh, well, okay, there might not be college football this year. Can I, can I go ahead and jump in the draft? I've, I've seen a little bit of talk about how that would work. I, I don't know how, I don't know how that would work. I yeah, think I like either. the ETNs, the Najee Harris's. I feel but like I don't the money think, would be so much smaller that they would be less, they yeah. would just wait it, wait a year, I would imagine. Yeah. Like, I don't know how the supplemental draft works monetarily, but like those guys are like high, high end picks that probably are leaving a lot of money on the table by. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point, Casey. Yeah. Because I mean, point. even they after you get out of the second round, you barely get any money. When, when the Browns took Josh Gordon in the second, they had to give up a second the next year. So I would assume that you the money that. might be similar, but. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, I don't know either. Hey, real quick, you mentioned uh, punting <laughs> on tight ends. Um, thoughts on Chase Claypool at all? Maybe, maybe like just the the upside of potentially moving to tight end for this. Tight end one. I've been, I've been, I've been, one. I've been finding myself drafting him. You know, in startups, we've been doing a lot of mocks and stuff like that on Patreon, and he ends up hanging around. And I just always scoop him up and and see if you can either maybe get double designation or he moves over. Bingo. Bingo. I mean, he'd be tied in one. If, if, if he gets drafted and the team comes out and says Claypool's going to be a move tight end for us, he's tied in one. And in tight end premium leagues, you're looking at a borderline first round pick in rookie drafts because at 6'4, 240, it might take a minute. Is ridiculous. Maybe before you're getting tons of return because I feel like that is probably the hardest position to transition like you see it usually take the longest to actually come in but if you got it right in the right situation with the right coach who was smart enough schematically you could definitely see gains right away so I always thought I think that's interesting because this tight end class everyone just keeps saying is boo-boo so yeah I'd pass on it and I don't really care if my tight end lines up in line or not that's why I was so high on Noah Fant last year like yeah I know everybody was over TJ Hawkinson and he may still be the better overall tight end. Maybe, maybe. but in fantasy, I don't care about that. I knew Noah Fant was an oversized wide receiver who was going to mm-hmm. play out of the slot. And towards the end of the season, it started to click started. for him. I agree a hundred percent. All right, man. Well, let's, we're going to finish this up with just some regular dynasty questions. How you apply, how you play rookie drafts and things like that. Um, so how do you yeah. play a rookie draft? We well, got something, give, Wayne? Let's give him one more plug. If you're tuning in right now, we're 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 hit chilling with Ray GQ, aka the Devi Doctor, aka yeah. Podzilla, aka the King of College, aka yeah, got it. Ray Gentleman's Quarterly. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. It's, it's not. It's, it's, that's not for GQ, right? Although you do take pride in your dressing uh, skills. That's it's Q Dog, right? Yes, Q Dog. Yes, sir. That's that's yes, your friend. Uh, Omega Sci Fi, right? I love you. You're the first <laughs> fucking guy to get it, man. Yes, that is my fraternity. Q hey, Dog, Omega no, Sapphire. We were tell, kicking tell around. Me, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask. Go ahead. Tell me. Uh, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but what, what's the worst hazing story you got? We're a non hazing organization. <laughs> we don't haze. We don't believe in that. Uh, I have no clue what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, we are a non hazing organization. All right, all right. That's the lawyer over there talking to us right now. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> fifth, fifth. <laughs> all right, all right. Anyway, follow him on Twitter at Ray G Q U E. Um, and be sure to hit up his YouTube channel, Destination Devi, for all of your film watching and podcast needs. So uh, hit him up. We're having a blast. Appreciate you coming on. Let's finish up with some Dynasty talk here. Let this man, the very busy man, get get to what he does. All right, man. How do you usually play the rookie draft? You 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 uh, you deal the picks. You keep the picks. How you how how do you how do you feel about that? The very wishy washy answer, right? It all depends. Depends on your team. Depends on your draft. Depends on your league mates. And I think the biggest thing that I would say is know your league. Know your league. Know your league mates. I think that's such an underrated um, like Skill. tip. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a skill tip. Like know your league mates. If you know that, uh, and that's why I tell people right now, you're so close to the rookie draft. Why would you even trade? Like for what? It makes no sense to trade unless you're just getting some astronomical return. But uh, on the clock is when I want to do it, especially after we know landing spot, when we know draft capital. But general strategy for me. In rookie drafts, I try to hammer running backs early. Um, They accrue value immediately. Uh, You know, as soon as, even if you're not the biggest A.J. Dillon fan, right, 
if you draft A.J. Dillon, he goes out there week one and rushes for 100 yards and catches a couple of passes. I mean, the, the chances of him doing that are a little bit higher than Jalen Rager from day one going out there catching 11 for 120 and one. It's just the receiver position takes a little bit longer for them to acclimate to, whereas running the ball, you just get it and fucking run. So uh, I, I really try to hammer running backs early. I really do not spend time drafting tight ends until much later. And when I'm drafting tight ends, I'm just looking for guys who are athletic. Um, but I would always look to trade. Like if the price is right, never say that you won't do it. You know, if the price is right, I'll move any pick, any player. So uh, in one of my most competitive leagues, I'm sitting at 102, 106, and 109. And I've got a plan. But if somebody wants the 102 and they're willing to pay, I'll move Jonathan Taylor. As in, he's not going to be the 101. No, nah, he won't. Super flex. I'm not uh, the number one. Yeah, Definitely. Burrow's going to go one. Well, that kind of wrapped into the next question we had. Are you more of a running back or receiver guy? We're, we're running back guys. We pretty much say the same thing all day, every day. We, we're running back heavy in startups to, to get going and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we're always – we've been preaching get your running backs early because, first of all, there's pretty much four wide receivers on the field at all times. Uh, they do take a little while to uh, come around, and the value spikes much quicker on the running back, and it's much harder to find – you know, a consistent player at that position. And it's just the point scoring. I mean, you can look at the top point scorers from wide receivers and put them up against the top point scorers for running backs, and it might be 100 points different. There's, there's years where it is 100 points difference. Yep. Yep. I need All that. Right. Well, the last question is, is that like as far as the running back stuff goes, would you draft like a tier two running back over a tier one receiver? I mean, I'm pretty sure he just said he was taking A.J. Dillon over Jalen Rager. <laughs> Did I? That's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. <laughs> words, not what I, uh, it's not what I meant. It's a lawyer. I'd say, I'd say, because so where are you taking CD Lamb? Where are you taking CD Lamb out of these running backs? In a, he would go after, he would go after Taylor, after Swift, after Dobbins, after Akers. I'd start thinking about it around the Akers, Edwards, Elaire range. But that's I'd great probably, answer. I, I would. Pr that's probably where I'm thinking. C.D. Lamb, Acres, Edwards, Elaire, Lamb. They're all right there. But I probably, if Edwards, Elaire, and Acres screw landing spot, if they get the draft capital, I'm probably still going to take the running backs before wide receivers because. I can find another wide receiver. Maybe I'm not the biggest KJ Hamler fan. Maybe I'm not the biggest LaVisca Chenault fan, but I could find me a receiver. I'd rather have my stud running back in LaVisca Chenault opposed to CeeDee Lamb and fucking Josh Kelly down the line. So I, I, I'm going to – that's about the range for me. As long as you didn't say the Michael P. Ryan there, we're good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to give P. Ryan any love. He's been burned by yeah. Samaje or what? What, what's uh he's all right he's yeah just, i agree he's just a guy he's just a guy you know and, i think he's slightly just, above just a guy but he's yeah here's right the in thing that. about running backs though they get crushed so much that all of these dudes are going to play dylan p ryan they're as long as they can make the active roster they're going we saw boston scott on the fucking field for the eagles like p Rod, these guys are going to get a chance to play. Will they stick? Will they have longevity? Don't know. But that's why in Dynasty, if, if you draft a LaMichael P. Ryan, right, and he has a blow-up game week one, don't, don't do the Thomas Rawls thing that we did years ago, holding on to Rawls thinking he was going to fucking trade. Strong him. example. Move him. Very strong. Move time, move <laughs> that player. Like, very rarely do the Arian Fosters rise from the ashes – I went out and bought all this fucking Matt Burita stock two years ago, paying second round picks late. Like, they, I don't know, man. It's just those dudes just don't stick around, man. Like, yeah. move them. Yeah, well, great examples and great, great examples going back there on both a couple of those name drops right there. Anybody got anything else for for Ray before we before we let him go? All right, busted <laughs> all my questions. Hey man, I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, man. You you've been great. Thanks for the time. I know I know you probably ran longer than you do on most shows. We run long. 
we kept Matt Waldman for two hours. So <laughs> uh, it's all good, man. Uh, I just want to say honestly, man, I, I really appreciate it, man. It's been a it's been a grind this draft season, and you know everything. We all are fathers. We all have families, man. You know we all have stuff going on. So I just want to say thank y'all for for inviting me on the show. This is going to be it for me for a little bit. So I had a really good time chopping it up with you. And this is the first one where we actually like, for some reason, people are afraid to like debate a little bit and be like, what the hell? Like, I enjoyed that. So I appreciate you guys having me on. Let me get that bone crusher drop one more time, Jay Wayne. (laughs) (laughs) I almost got the attend hub, but I didn't know when I would use that. So I didn't, I didn't do it. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll hopefully we'll see you again, maybe after the draft or whenever you're back doing shit or middle season or some shit, but I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Thank Follow him at Ray GQ destination. Devi, check him out. Appreciate the time, man. Really do. Ray, if we don't have a college season, I'm going to need you back here to teach me about these next set of guys. I got you, big dog. I got sounds you. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, man. Peace. Thanks again, man.